Hello, hello, and welcome to Hometown. Let's get into the show. Hello, hello, I am Hometown. I am Mayor Wad. <laughs> that is Hometown. I'm Hometown. You are Hometown. <laughs> <laughs> and up there is the AI. The music was playing pretty loud. Uh, go for it. Good evening, hometown citizens. Yeah, so uh, today is uh, season two, episode one eighty four, uh, for July third, twenty twenty three. What goes up, and more news. Today we've already selected all twelve of the articles. We actually um, kind of had to rush uh, to get everything done today. It's been a little crazy, so. Um, Pardon the, the, the mess. Uh, consider it a construction site. And the fact that um, for me to actually play several of my games that I'm going to be playing over the uh, coming month, um, I've had to disable my standard workflow. I mentioned this yesterday early at the beginning of the uh, yesterday's show, but I figured I'd share it with you again today. So if things seem a little clunky, it's because I'm waiting for a piece of equipment that will allow me to get back to the method that I was using before and make life a little bit easier. Um, so uh, without much further ado, welcome Toll to the show. Appreciate it. Um, well, OK, I don't know how I feel about that, Toll. <laughs> uh, but good to see you here. <laughs> That's awesome. Literally no one else is on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh so <laughs> no thanks for stopping by I really do appreciate it um okay so let's get into today's news um man this is so weird having normally i have just one mouse and i can control multiple machines one keyboard one mouse um and uh now it's all kinds of wonky so anyway without further ado i'm not even going to preamble beyond the last two minutes of just babbling about whatever has been coming out. I don't know. Just incoherent. You know what I mean? So let's get going. The very first uh, article for today is in the Smack Talk channel. Humane announces its wearable communicator will be named Humane AI Pin, which just doesn't make any sense for a name. They should... Name it something that people are really going to buy into. For crying out loud, AI pin? You mean a company established by former Apple executives has revealed the name of its wearable Star Trek style communicator that, first, that was uh, first showed off in April 2023. So let's go over to the source. This is over in Apple Insider. Um, this is It's really interesting because I actually uh, talked about this early last year as well in that I wanted a communicator that would allow me to talk with whoever is on the other side of it, uh, similar to what the Apple Watch is doing, except that I wouldn't have to <laughs> hold my watch or tap anything on my watch. I would just simply be tap my communicator pin like a, a Star Trek style communicator. Well, after the sneak peek of its uh, product in April, um, Humane has now revealed the name of it. It's going to be called the Humane AI Pin. It will formally launch to the public in 2023. Um, yeah, Toll says Dick Tracy wrist walkie. Yep. Um, and that's basically how we've treated Apple Watches. Um, when I use it, People are blown away when I pay for stuff using it. People are just spectacularly blown away. There, there are people that have still not seen it, which I'm kind of surprised by because it's become pretty ubiquitous. You know, it's everywhere. Um, just like Teslas have slowly bled into just, okay, there's another car, except that it is an all electric luxury vehicle. Although, you know, I've been told many a time now that fitment on the later models these earlier actually the younger models the ones that are just now coming out aren't all that great um but 
still it's considered a luxury vehicle all of the doodads and doohickeys you have to add on to it like home charging at a higher level because you're not going to be plugging it into a standard outlet um you know it's becoming ubiquitous a, a pin like this with the ability to communicate with somebody i think would be great particularly if it has the ability to act like a more like a smart computer than just a plain communicator where you tap it and it is point to point communication if it does have ai and allows for things a little bit beyond just that point to point then i'm going to be very happy now i haven't read this article and uh really uh, since the initial hint that it was coming out i haven't been paying attention to this company but i knew about the company i knew about the product um but i didn't know what its capabilities really ultimately were going to be uh, the device's physical appearance resembles the narrow yet bulky communicator badge seen in star trek it's designed as a wearable typically positioned over the heart area while the top part likely houses a microphone and speaker, the bottom part is equipped with a laser projector. Um, while no significant details have been released about the device, the laser projector was demonstrated showing phone controls on the wearer's outstretched hands. So that was something where basically you put your hand out in front of you and it projects where you can tap. Um, since then, the company has recruited several former employees, Apple employees. Um, in March, Humane made the public announcement stating their intention to develop a software platform and transition towards artificial intelligence, marking a significant shift after years of maintaining a secretive approach. So this is going to be pretty neat. Um, I'm actually, it says here that there's a wait list. Uh, people have the option to join a wait list on the official Humane website. But are you already on it? No, maybe. I don't know. Here, let me see. I can check real quick. Let's do this live. No, I don't think I am. Huh. I mean, how are you going to keep up with the latest AI? Yeah, really? Yeah, I don't think I am. Okay, sorry, folks, for the dead air. Uh, I wanted to do this live. So um, I don't think they have much in terms of video on here. It's definitely not this one. Um, I have a rule. It, it, the, the rule is that if you pause ran, truly randomly any naturally playing video, um, you will not look like a respectable human being you'll look completely derpy um totally goofy it's there's just a rule about it right and that you can always take that little snippet and then caption it with something funny and it's going to be appropriate right like this guy's going are like a pirate right i don't know anyway um keep an eye out for the humane ai pin Please change the name. I Exactly. <laughs> it sounds way too cool to have that name. <laughs> yeah, I really don't like that name. Anyway, uh, Andrew Orr, I didn't say it at the beginning. Sorry about that, Andrew. Andrew Orr over at appleinsider.com put the article together. Um, let's hope it's it's actually pretty powerful. What I want is something that allow that communicates um, and allows for that communication to be private. Like I want to be able to put an IEM in, in in my ears and um, have communication be spoken out loud. I can walk down the street and talk and it'll pick it up. But what I hear is through my earpiece, not through the communicator. That would be insane because it would be a cacophony of, you know, a, a little speaker on a pin blaring out to the crowd, etc. Uh, I'm not interested in that. Uh, but I would really like to be able to just do immediate point-to-point -point communications and ask for instructions or directions or anything like that and, and be told, hey, walk five blocks this way, turn left, etc. And it's in my earpiece. I think that would be, that would, would be, be amazing. primo. Yeah, pretty amazing. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next article. I will throw 
uh, the article, the last article into chat real quick. Sorry about that. Um, still working on a solution to facilitate this in a better way. <clears throat> um, I blame the AI. No, just kidding. I'm the mayor. And the electrons stop with me. Um, so the next article is over in the hometown daily, uh, channel on hometown.com. That's also this show, um, ocean gate threatened to sue its formal former chief pilot in 2018, unless he withdrew allegations that he'd been fired in retaliation for raising safety concerns, according to a report. Now I had heard about this, um, and I think it's astonishing. I've actually had people, um, quite upset uh online uh stating things similar to well i wish that that dude rush had lived so that people could sue him into the ground well the company still exists um i'm sure that nobody will invest in it and if they do they're going to be buying the ip which might be applicable but obviously the demonstrator didn't quite work out um, so I don't know if the company even has a viable chance to exist, um, in the near future. Um, so people can still, and they probably are going to be suing ocean gate right out of existence. I haven't actually pursued any, you know, monitoring of this company. Um, but this actually shows that uh, another point where the knowledge that this existed, um, this flaw, this security issue, whatever it might have been, had gone under the radar because there was no uh, policy, procedure, regulation, anything in place. And when somebody did bring it up, if they broached even the beginnings of a conversation about regulation and testing and stuff like that they were either dismissed or suppressed or censured in some way um, marginalized and uh, then if they continued they would be threatened and when you look at somebody like stockton rush who's threatening to bring you into the courtroom they have millions or billions you know the that's why i really despise the idea of every wingnut fever dream from a billionaire uh, coming into existence because if you poo poo it either they attorneys or their social army will come knocking on your door because you have a differing view and you don't necessarily trust the fact that it's going to be done right this is just one example this isn't the rule but I trust but verify and I've seen many many others where the only problem is that they didn't throw enough money at it or capture the regulate regulatory bodies um, and uh, but I have been I've seen that I've been victim of that I've I've watched it happen um, yeah, up until now it, it typically happens that all you need is enough money and political influence and you can make something happen why wasn't there a regulatory body in place for something like this so that it now there will be going forward yeah and all of these people that the just so everybody is abundantly aware of this the five people that went down there were told well <laughs> the four victims and the one idiot they were <laughs> They were told again and again and again that everything's fine everything's fine everything's fine my understanding is the teenager was actually petrified to go down there but was assured again and again and again um and here we go so ocean gate threatened to sue the former employee unless he withdrew allegations per the you the new yorker david lockridge claimed he was fired in retaliation for raising safety concerns about the sub um, fired in 2018 after meeting with the Ocean Gate CEO, Stockton Rush, where they discussed safety. Now, I think many of us have seen the texts and, and the discussion that has had taken place via emails and through, through texts. Um, and um, it, 
it's abundantly clear that people knew that there was a problem and it wasn't uh, resolved almost intentionally because they had to have money. They didn't have enough money or they didn't want to spend their own personal capital. So they would sell seats and enough people made it so that they could keep on making the product. Lo and behold, it collapses. I read a related article about this and it was yet another person that had actually really wanted to be on board and couldn't. They were a researcher and while they were trying to raise money to um, get the seat, even though I think it was at a discounted price, they ousted the person and picked somebody that was basically paying for the full price. But the person, of course, was writing it after the the accident had occurred so it was just interesting wow it's a shame Sinead Baker over at uh, businessinsider.com put this article together Um, and that's basically the summary uh, what I just described Um, and I've added some of what I know from other discussions from other um, uh, articles Lockridge told former Ocean Gate advisor Rob McCallum Uh, in March 2018 that he had contacted the U.S. Department of Labor and told the Occupational Safety and Hazard uh, Health, sorry, Health Administration, OSHA, um, that he was fired in retaliation for raising safety concerns. And they basically said, hey, we're going to sue you if you don't retract that statement. The court summons informed Lockridge that if he did not withdraw his claim with OSHA and send OceanGate $10,000 in legal fees, OceanGate would sue him, as well as try to destroy his professional reputation and accuse him of immigration fraud, the New Yorker reported. So it gets a little bit scummier with each sentence. Pretty shocking. Lockridge received the summons while he was at his father's funeral, so... Wow. I'm Uh, really interested to know whether he did track those um, complaints because this is a lot more interesting if those agencies were notified of this. Yeah. um, Gilman also told OSHA that Lockridge had deliberately gotten himself fired because he wanted to leave his job and maintain his ability to collect unemployment benefits and said, Lockridge was first hired by Ocean Gate in 2015 as its director of marine operations and chief pilot. In a safety report in January 2018, Lockridge pointed to alleged issues that were either defects or unproven, the New Yorker reported. He said he wanted there to be an official record of concerns he had previously raised verbally. So, I mean, a lot of stuff that's done verbally needs to be documented because it might come back to bite you on the ass. Um, and frankly, I think we're all trying to be friendly and trying to be, um, I don't know, uh, approachable and 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 social and and friendly. I don't know. It's just about trying to be friendly. Where you say to somebody, "Hey, you know." this is failing. I need you to take a look at it. And and they go, Oh, okay. And they give you a cursory look and they say, everything's fine. Um, and then years later you go, God, you know, if I would have documented this better, I would not be having to scratch so damn hard to get this resolved, uh, because it would have been documented. And so, um, pro-life tip folks, if you have something that is, um, I don't know how to put it, like a capital improvement, something that is physical, something that has to do with your health, something that is important to you. Don't just make it a verbal communication. Uh, Demand that there is some type of written documentation that there is something taking place. And if you don't, if they don't like it, then think of it like you're being hacked by somebody, you know, calling you up and saying that you need $500 immediately. Well, they're trying to rush you into taking an action that's going to cost you. And that's what it is. If somebody with the solution that may also be the cause of this harm decides to push you in a direction, then you need to push back and say, no, I want it documented because obviously 
you're saying one thing and if it goes all to pot later all you have to go and all you have to say is uh, i don't know what you're talking about I, I don't remember that conversation so well and like also it. it's a red flag if somebody won't put something like that in writing yeah now sometimes you have to deal with the other party and that's really unavoidable but yeah, if they and don't if respond, you can't get them to do it. You document it. You document. You send them an email and say, "Hey, I sent it on this date. If you're not monitoring this email address, well, guess what? This is the one that the public is interacting with. So somebody better be." So, uh, I I say document, document, document. Now nowadays, you know, when I was younger, I didn't care, but you know, now you have to be responsible. Good luck. Okay, let's move on to the next article. Oh, this one's um, broken. I'll have to fix it. Um, but um, this next article is uh, has nothing to do with that video that's playing, so I'm going to play it um, or refresh it. So this one is over at The Hill. Uh, Travis Schlepp is the author of this article. This is something that we had been talking about uh, for several months now, watching this happen. Uh, off and on an article has been aggregated into hometown and uh, just so you all know I'll throw this into the chat and at the bottom of this page is actually the visit the source link uh, but the aggregator kind of crunched up that little bit um, but I'll resolve it and you can follow the link and you'll be taken here and uh, this house is kind of weird it it seems like it would be more attuned to being a commercial space than a house but it's an actual residence um obviously the person that buys the home is going to be the one that has the imagination and can see all the great things about it well i don't so when i was watching it i'm like this is kind of weird they have this cover over it, but I don't know if it's for construction or if it's so that you can't look out and see the Los Angeles flood control channel. Um, but this is in uh, the hill.com changing America. Um, and it's titled California bridge house sells for $180,000 over its asking price because it went viral and people started a bidding war. Um, so it's a unique house built on the uh, side of the Los Angeles County, um, has found a new owner. The unusual house sparked a wider conversation about affordable housing in the area and then priced people out. <laughs> so there's some irony for you. Douglas Lee, the listing agent called it the strangest property he's ever had. So this is it. Um, it's obviously a fixer upper. There's damage right here. Oh man, if I mouse over it, it makes it a fog of war um, and that's a flood control channel underneath it so it's sitting right on what amounts to a bridge because there is a road that is at the level of the rooftop deck so you can walk off the curb and onto the rooftop deck and just like stand right there um, the home isn't available uh, isn't visible on google maps for some reason uh the single family residence is actually below street level uh, accessible by a staircase that descends to the front door inside visitors will find one bedroom one bathroom within its 462 square feet of living space and that actually looks bigger than that at least to me i don't know uh, and i've lived in small places so um so that is the actual rooftop deck. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll call it a deck. You own that as well. And I suppose the space above it to a point. The home was built in 1949. Features a patio that overlooks the Alhambra Wash flood control channel. As well as a rooftop patio about the size of the home itself, which is actually located at street level. They say that there's a mold issue and no parking. So I guess you can't park up here because it wasn't engineered to do so, which really kind of sucks. Depending on the foundation, and it looks like it's pretty solid, they could probably re-engineer this so that you can do that. I have a parking deck right here. 
At least that'd hope. be something. I mean, it's tough enough to get to this house, and then you can't park there. Yeah, you gotta park on the street. The home's previous owner bought the home in 2005 for $72,000 with plans to use it as a deluxe man cave. You have to say man cave like that. Man cave. Toll says, so why would someone want to live with cars driving over their home? Like my grandmother's house was 200 feet from a major highway and you could hear every truck go by. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I was looking at a house once with the AI on a USB drive in my pocket and um, it was <laughs> it was fascinating the way that it was trying to be sold to us which was uh, don't go outside really they kind of kind of kept it a secret um, the house was really well built but when you opened the back door you were basically on a major freeway up a hill um, and even with the wall barrier there, it, it sounded like, um, the Colorado river, like constantly just and, like and, right at the point of waterfall or something. I mean, it was so loud. Yeah. It was massively loud and constant. And we were like, yeah, we noped right out of there. And inside the house, it was nice. Like it was really roomy. It had the, a nice floor plan. It had nice quality stuff. But when you opened up the sliding glass door to the backyard, it was like being slammed in the face by Niagara Falls. Um, so we just kind of bowed out of there. So Toll says it's fine. You couldn't own an ice internal combustion engine to park there anyway. So maybe an electric moped spot with a charging cable. I don't know if it can handle that weight. Even that, right? They're saying that it has a mold issue. It looks like there's standing water issues right here. I'd be afraid to walk on that until I had another engineer come and take a look at it. They don't say what the final price is, right? No, the a bidding war ensued with the winning offer coming in at a whopping $430,000. Are you kidding me? Which it's is four... ridiculously expensive for what it is, but it is pretty cheap for Southern California. It's $1,000 a square foot. That's crazy. Well, there's also a living in LA issue. Tull says, well, there's also a living in LA issue. Yeah. True. <laughs> yeah, that might be the major <laughs> drawback. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that I can ever return. I once lived in San Diego and I don't think I could ever return there. Um, when I have gone back, it's been nothing but a concrete slab with water on the border and uh, mountains on the other side, well, forest on the far other side, but everything in between is like one giant concrete slab. So no thanks. As much as I like San Diego and, and the weather, Oceanside and Carlsbad and La Jolla and all of that, yeah, um, all the way up the coast. It's kind of like that nowadays. Um, it'll soon become San Angeles where it's San Diego and Los Angeles and San Francisco, just one long strip of cement. <laughs> you want to go on to the next article? Yes. <laughs> yes. Next article is over in hometown daily. These are the best cities in the world for a healthy work life balance and analysis has found almost all of them are in Europe. All you have to do is worry about the band getting put back together Russia and so on um, so Europe is leading the way for healthy work-life balance an analysis by Forbes found US cities failed to make the grade however cost of living is through the freaking roof I can imagine Tulsa says I would like to go sand dog once to attend their submarine birthday ball uh, and visit a zoo and never return to that Bass ask words state. <laughs> it's uh, many states are a nice place to visit, but you don't want to live there, kind of a thing. Maybe there, but see, I can't say that entirely. You know, there's always places that are great where you can live in little niche areas. Um, it really depends on your demeanor. You know, if you're really into crowds, then big city is awesome. 
if you're work, if you're into working your ass off constantly trying to make ends meet and and but making a serious chunk of change for whatever it is you're doing as long as you can do it then you know big cities are awesome um if you've paid everything off you have no burdens and you want a nice chill life then there are places in every state for that too and uh, if you want to avoid politics then that'll make you even healthier there um sure there's some redeeming area of california around the tahoe area is nice i hear yeah um 29 palms no <laughs> okay so um europe is leading the way so let's go take a look let me check something out real quick sorry folks everybody needs to uh entertain themselves Okay, sorry about that. A little bit of dead air. Um, I had to take care of something. Otherwise, things would break. Um, okay, so this next article is over in um, uh, Business Insider. Uh, Beatrice Nolan. These are the best cities in the world for a healthy work-life balance and analysis has found. Almost all are in Europe. So it says almost all. The little snippet, right? All, almost all so they say that the united states didn't make the grade so where do you think the others might be europe is already it says almost all are in europe which is a pretty big chunk well it's got to include probably like norway um maybe portugal or spain Right. I'm thinking it's places that value vacation and kind of chilling out, but I don't know. Tull says um, maybe Middle East for a non-Europe location, maybe Japan. I'm having a hard time. I'm honestly, I'm having a hard time. Work-life balance. I mean life is pretty all-encompassing of things right so you have to take a whole lot into consideration what the gamut is of life right so social strife and issues and stuff like that you have a lot of countries you have to worry about work it may not be there the cost of living is through the roof inflation or deflation uh, conflict um not much opportunities depending on if you're native or foreigner then you're frowned upon right i think oh. you're overthinking this am i that would not be unheard of for the mayor i try to think in uh, in bulk about i should say holistically about something oh wait i've got some others to add probably iceland um uh, nothing else at the uh, moment. <laughs> see, now I think that you're parsing your database. Um, so the best places, uh, the best places to live for a good work-life balance: Denmark, Helsinki, Stockholm, Oslo, Auckland, New Zealand is the one that I was going to say. Uh, Gothenburg, Sweden, which just sounds like an epic location to be. Reykjavik, Iceland. You have to love mushroom soup, though, right? They do like their mushrooms. Vienna, Edinburgh, Scotland, Belfast, Northern Ireland. As long as none of the They've... strife returns. Right, exactly. Is fine, right? Vienna is one I wouldn't have necessarily expected, but. I don't know much about it. So Toll says, I agree, Madam AI, Norway, specifically Bergen, may have a high aggregate tax rate, but they provide a ton of social services. See, I mean, and I, I really truly wish that people wouldn't have an issue with a high tax rate with the social services dynamic if it was efficient if the efficacy of the of it was there um 
I mean, our national uh, freeway system, our highways, our schools, fire, etc. It's all socialized um, here in the States, but people still get bent out of shape about it. And I don't think that it does that much harm. There's inefficiencies, yes, but upon review analysis, long term over the scale of uh, periods of 20 years, the return on your investment is eight times the amount that's put into the system. For every dollar that gets put into the federal system, it's eight times the benefit. Um, so I, I think it there's a longer discussion, but you have to be open to that discussion. And I don't think that a lot of people are. I, that's not quite true. I'd say that 80% are, 20% are not. Um, but if the cost of living goes down and there's social benefits that make work-life balance better and you don't have to work 40 hours a week busting your hump, um, you know, I, I see that as a win. Phil says, well, fire is sort of socialized. Connecticut is primarily run by volunteer departments, which are independent LLCs funded by taxpayer money. Correct. Yeah, that's how a lot of places are. Uh, nope, but I get it, volunteer, but there are lifers that are involved in that process. Um, there are certain salaried employees that drive the, the bus, so to speak. Um, so... New Zealand. Yeah, I think that would be. The European piece threw me off. I didn't think of New Zealand. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought it would be. Either, I honestly, I was struggling to say either New Zealand or Australia, but Australia, everybody kind of, it's a meme, but everybody says that everything there wants to kill you. So I. Yeah, that doesn't sound very relaxing. Yeah. But New Zealand, I, it is one of the places that I have yet to go to. I would love to go to it. Um, and uh, Iceland, it's the only two that are not um, Europe, right? Yeah. Iceland is part of Europe. Oh, really? Well, I guess I don't know my geography. Well, it's out there on its own, but it's still part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we have some news about a particular island that may not become, not, may not stay where it's currently designated. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. The top city is only a 70 and uh, number 10 is 57 says toll. So they were pretty strict with their uh, evaluation. If this was out of a hundred. Yeah, that's interesting because then nothing really knocked it out of the park. But... Yeah, do they say that it was actually out of 100? The implication is that it's there at a, out of 100. And I don't think it says it's a happiness index. Annual leave policies. Wow, they actually had quite a bit. There's actually a link in here in analysis by Forbes has found. So you can follow the link. Let me throw that link into the... Uh, chat so at least it's there for you the, it's almost a 13 point spread and the highest letter grade is a C <laughs> so <laughs> college professor got it um, they actually break it down into more uh, like pictures uh, which is something it's a specialty of Business Insider um, I, I, I love Business Insider for their uh, pictures in their articles um, but they don't say anything else really in the article I mean look at that you know and, I mean I and, can see why the work-life balance is great just look outside <laughs> yeah I think it would be amazing but you know just like what happens now you don't how many people walk outside their house after living in the place for 20 years and and go man this place is still beautiful they basically just go oh I gotta go pick the weeds um, and, and they're again, more pragmatic about it, but depends on if you're a half full or half empty kind of person. Really? Yeah. Half full people would still say that. 
you're an AI. Sorry for the dead air. Um, anyway, uh, so number one is Copenhagen, Denmark, work life balance 70.5. If it is a 100 point scale, like Toll is suggesting, which uh, there's no reason to not believe that it's a 100 point scale it's really sad that 70 is the highest <laughs> it basically means the work-life balance is so out of whack that there is no way to get to 80 i'll take 80 or maybe it does have to do with the high costs um and so while they have really great things maybe there's still high cost of living or something i mean we, we don't know for... enough from this article like how much went into it I wonder if money is like the biggest way on this. Uh, you know what? So we're going to, what I'll do is we'll save this. Um, and uh, if this has any significance to further discussion, then we can discuss it tomorrow. I think that'd be great. It looks like they just added the scores from half a dozen indices uh, to give a total score according to Toll. So Toll, I think, went and looked at uh, the other article. So, um, Cool. Thanks. That's exactly <laughs> that right there is exactly the dynamic that I like. <laughs> um, it's working. Yay. Um, yeah, I. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the this is like a longitudinal study, right? They didn't do any real. Perhaps they didn't do any like empirical research. They just grabbed what other people have been putting together and they distilled it down to a single indicator. Um, uh, or they did their own. I don't know. Again, I'd have to go and uh, look. But uh, yeah, come on. A C? Barely? <laughs> Barely. 70.5. Well, think, think what our score would be. <laughs> We're not even on We're it. not on the scale. We have to be below 57. <laughs> in their top 25, only two are not in Europe. New Zealand and Abu Dhabi. Top 25. So Europe, basic C? Oh, wow. A little bit of socialized this and that, which we really are. I hate to break it to people, but we really are in a, it's a socialized republic. We, we pay taxes and great good is done on our behalf from roads to schools to power to blah, blah, blah. I mean, a lot of the infrastructure is done in a socialized setting. We still pay a bill in for our consumption, but the infrastructure is augmented by taxpayers by way of grant and stuff like that. So, oh, sorry, I need to look closer. I read Australia and read Austria. Oh, okay. Yeah, no worries, Toll. Um, so yeah, um, I didn't know really, I, cause we were, uh, Toll and I both said, um, Austria, but I guess Austria is like buried right in there. So kind of, I dirt, it's okay. Um, so let's move on to the next article. America's first law regulating AI bias is hiring uh, in hiring takes effect this week. We're going to go through this one really quick because it's basically um, triggered by events using an AI and finding out that AI is biased based on the inputs that are that it's receiving. It can basically shift what the results are and ultimately impact hiring practices. So artificial intelligence isn't simply changing how we do our jobs. It's also deciding whether we get jobs at all. Companies are increasingly incorporating algorithmic tools into their hiring processes from software that reads our resumes to AI bots that score our first interviews. This again goes to like that pitching bot thing with AI and two iPhones de determining that I just suck because whatever. And I'd use the example of AI scanning resumes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I think it's weird. I also think that the only way that it actually works, but still doesn't get the subtlety of the human condition <laughs> is that in bulk, it can weed out 
certain stats. But you don't know what you don't know about a candidate. So as long as they meet the minimum that you have announced publicly that this is what they should be doing, all the rest of it should be a humanistic perspective. It shouldn't be. Let's use an AI to drill through the minutia of something that's written. Well, that means that there's going to be thousands potentially of a candidate of candidates applying for a job. So when you post that job, you had better enumerate in a very comprehensive manner what you are looking for. Because if you don't, then you're going to get a whole bunch of people. And then when you use an AI to weed it all out, you're going to miss the gem. You're going to miss the person that has chemistry with your company that understands the culture that's creative, but just doesn't have the opportunity yet to show it. That's fully capable to develop the knowledge, skills, and abilities to excel in your corporation. And you'll miss them because you used a tool that's cold, callous, and inhuman. Yeah, sorry. So again, it says here um, over in uh, Quartz, it's QZ.com. Um, while the law aims for transparency, critics say it may not be enough to protect against AI bias. Um, it's written by Gabriella Riccardi. Uh, I don't have the account active, so I can't really get into it. Um, but this is just another, um, it's amplification of the fact that AI is impacting our future. Um, when, when people say that, you know, this or that is taking our jobs, this is directly taking our jobs. You're not going to be able to get a job if you can't make it by the AI. I never um, thought of the AI taking jobs as meaning this, but that's absolutely what it is. Because you've removed the human from it. So Toll says, okay, let me get this straight. We are increasing the minimum wage for hiring human workers, making mental tasks more cost effective to feed to an AI ML program. Um, but now we're going to regulate the ability to use AI ML to make that human worker able to focus on more complicated tasks. Also, how can AI ML uh, program be biased unless the programmer or purchaser puts bias into the algorithm. That's exactly what happens. The data itself. Um, oh, gotcha here. Let me post the link. Sorry about that. Uh, the link itself. Uh, sorry, the uh, the data that it receives itself um, is uh, biased. And so what ends up happening is the algorithm, the machine learning portion of it learns based on its inputs and then acts on those inputs on the artificial intelligence side. So the expert system starts to say, well, based on my worldview, everything that is blue is great. And so all it's doing is allowing you to hire people that posted a picture with uh, blue clothing on uh, because it is insular it doesn't have a world view it only has the view well it does have a world view but it's only of its inputs so a programmer can mess it up and until humans are infallible all of our creations are going to be fallible and thus an ai is fallible um here again let me just <laughs> i'm gonna do this um, oh, pretty much every time AI comes into the picture here, the the caption, or I should say the 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 catch-all liability um, disclaimer here for AI, the most well-known AI, um, which is ChatGPT, OpenAI, it flat out says ChatGPT may produce inaccurate information about people, places, or facts. It's, so does that leave anything? <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. It's only truthful statement that you can take at face value is the fact that it'll spew bullshit. Um, but I think if there was actually a way to input unbiased data, which I'm not sure there is, I don't think the AI itself is the is where the bias is occurring, of course. 
um, but it's possibly amplifying the bias. It's definitely putting the bias into action because what is being kicked out is um, being taken at face value. And when you have 10,000 applicants, you need 500 of them. It's distilling down to those 500. And then they're saying, well, this is so big. I can't possibly take this on as a human. So let's just hire those 500. And Toll says, garbage in, garbage out. HR and hiring agency have been using filters and word finders for years to highlight keywords and resumes and filter out the ones that don't hit a certain number of buzzwords so they don't waste brain space and time on candidates without a without the credentials they're looking for yeah and that's that actually has typically been standard practice when it became too complex to filter through the minutia of things so what ended up happening was they say they set certain triggers like if you don't have this um certification or you don't have this designation or you haven't done this number of credits for a particular job or you haven't done this experience um, then you're we're not interested and lo and behold this is that on steroids and taking into consideration things that a human wouldn't normally be able to comprehend uh, because they the AI, the machine learning process, basically creates a web of connections that's almost impenetrable by a human. Um, it can distill it out. And when you say, well, what was your, what was the framing of your decision for hiring this person? It can spew out a bunch of stuff, but then see that, that disclaimer statement. <laughs> it could be complete bullshit that it said and there's been stories of people that, for example, are doing the exact job that they're hiring for yeah. and they don't make it through those very filters. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but uh, many people that I've spoken to have heard stories about people with PhDs that can't get a job. They have an applicable field and frankly, uh, there's a lot of people that say, well, they got a PhD in sociology. That's almost a, a unusable job, but that's not true. Sociology degrees actually uh, allow you to work in limitless fields, but you can't break through because there may be some type of bias uh, in the hiring process. Um, so uh, Toll says that's why learning to write a good resume is hard and gets harder as technology for screening candidates advances. Yeah, and um, there's a lot of people that are looking for higher paying jobs that are outside their normal field um, because there aren't as many of those jobs because they're being automated. Um, so we're literally pushing people into having to be more competitive for fewer jobs in other areas. Yeah. I'm sorry for the dead air folks. Um, so uh, Tulsa says, I, I mean, being able to have an AI ML program, read a previous employer and multitask to look up the company and position in the, resume to cross-reference the validity of their work experience instead of just assuming that the applicant is putting relevant references down that would be a huge for employers um, looking for actual viable quality candidates yeah that whole verifying references and performance that is still a human uh, mandated element only a human is going to be able to verify um, the an AI just won't be, ever be able to do that. Um, so the AI, it can only take what is given to them. It doesn't have the ability to go out and parse anything that's contextual. They'd have to be told, go to this website. This website has data that says that it is this candidate's portfolio. Go ahead and evaluate that. And that kind of stuff just doesn't exist. Um, there might be a URL in somebody's resume, but um, that's usually reviewed by a human being. And I'd be afraid of an AI 
parsing a portfolio. Um, because it just, it's zeros and ones to an AI. It, it doesn't really truly understand anima. It doesn't understand the human condition. It only knows words and their definitions. And sometimes if it's programmed into their large language model, what slang is or what a certain context is, but for the most part, they're still ignorant that there's subtle meaning and emotion. So, okay. Um, let's hustle on to the next article. We're about halfway through. Oh. Um, so this next article is over in hometown daily recyclers reject most plastic. This company turns it into furniture. Um, a lot of plastic. First off, I am, uh, a, I'm not a proponent of plastic. <laughs> I'm surrounded by it, but I'm not a proponent of it. Um, because of the current research suggests that microplastics are flaking off constantly. They're getting into our biological processes. Um, they're finding it during autopsies. They're finding it during uh, biopsies. They're finding it in blood. They're finding it everywhere uh, in animals. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think I've seen anything that suggests that they found it in plant material that's growing. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised by that. Um, they've, but they've found it in food because it flakes off con from containers and stuff like that. Right. Um, so this article says recyclers reject most plastic. This company turns it into furniture. So now you're going to end up with plastic furniture flaking off in wherever you are. Uh, packaging for lotion, toothpaste, and makeup is a recycling disaster for Refactory, a UK-based family business. This is a complex process to give it a new life. It makes plywood-like plastic boards and turns them into furniture, planters, and more. Um, Tolt says um, that would be huge for employers looking to uh, for actual viable quality candidates regarding the AI. Um, totally want to start taking chairs and benches out of the out of the junk cars we get in the scrapyard and make furniture out of it. That's upcycling. Um, and if you do it right, people will pay big bucks for it. Um, I, that is no joke. <laughs> you make a name for yourself and, and people buy into your style and they will pay thousands of dollars, just like artwork where you're looking at it and you're going, that's just a shade of blue. Why is it $10,000? Yeah, it's because the provenance of the artist. Um, God made dirt, dirt don't hurt, but man made plastic and it's the devil. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 uh, so, so true. How many times has anybody ever said to you when you fall down, rub some plastic on it? No, it's always rub some dirt in it. Because dirt isn't going to hurt you. Come on. That's totally not true, but it can actually hurt you quite a bit. <laughs> so probably refactory not as much as plastic though. I'm sorry. So probably not as much as plastic though. Yeah, that's right. Tulsa says just spit on it. It'll make it feel better. Yeah, I have somebody in my life that I say, oh, I pulled a muscle and they say punch it. I don't know what's going on with that person, but that's OK. Uh, refactory re uh, processes post consumer waste from collection bins around the UK, along with recalled and or expired manufacturing waste that never hit shelves. Uh, tall. Hmm. Title nine violation right there. Toll says, want me to kiss it, make it feel better. Why do I hear that? Like <laughs> my parent would say that to me. I, I've been so it's kind of Pavlovian, right? Like you're like, having a flashback or something. Yeah, it's. Uh, I've been conditioned to respond in a certain way emotionally. Wow, that's really weird. I didn't think that there was that still going on in my head, but apparently it is. So, hey, this is muted, and so I'm going to play this. I'm really curious what the actual process is, because I've seen many a different plastic manufacturer remanufacturer recycling system um and uh i'm game for another one that that didn't look like there was anything wrong with those but there is 
usually manufacturing flaws um, where they get rid of it. Oh, it looks like they turn it into, it said that it turns them into bricks. And the boards. Yeah, that too. Um, but that, that looks like, um, wow, that's pretty cool. But it's plastic. I really do have a, but that looked like glass and other things too. It looked like a composite of whatever. So they throw it into a grinder and then they skim it to a certain size, CNC the hell out of it. Um, take all of that waste and throw it back in. It's pretty much the epitome of upcycling. They're just changing the shape dramatically. So pretty cool. Yeah, I, I like I like the idea of this. I, I still just don't like plastic. Um, there's a longer video. Let me throw that video or that link into the chat as well. Um, and we can talk about it. Um, some more or later or online. Um, it says uh, packaging for lotion, toothpaste and um, I mean, and um, other products like pizza boxes alone um, they can't recycle pizza boxes because the oil from the pizza contaminates it to the point where it can't be extracted easily so it doesn't make economic sense so this company just grabs whatever and uh, turns it into uh, new material i'd be worried about using it for anything structural uh, any serious load uh, only because i don't think that you can have a contiguous piece um, but it is what it is. The recycling center that, uh, toll brings scrap metal and tires to has a big machine that chops the metal into little chunks and then pours that into a triaxle dump truck to be brought to a processing plant. Yep. Uh, recycling is pretty great. It's always better when it's done at an industrial level. Um, but it usually starts at home. Um, a lot of manufacturers of goods um, actually send their mistakes to a recycling center so that it can come right back right to them. And it's an entire loop um, where everybody is engaged in communicating how much wastage there is so that they know how much to produce to send it right back to the manufacturer. Um, but it says there isn't much demand for the plastic furniture. So refactory gives a lot um, to schools, which again, it's plastic. So it's going to be flaking off microplastics, which I, I'm not too hip to giving it to the most vulnerable. <laughs> uh, yeah. Adults have made their choices. Uh, kids, they make different choices and putting plastic all around them isn't necessarily their choice. They don't even realize that microplastics are becoming pervasive you can put carbon um, under enough pressure it becomes diamond i'm willing to bet if you compressed sheets of reprocessed plastic under enough pressure it'll be a solid as at least a soft wood um it's actually stronger in certain uses um but the it depends on how it's being which kind of stress for instance you can't you would never be able to use that type of plastic to repair well we'll talk about it actually i'll use it in context so let's uh let's go on to the next article so this next article uh, is something that i've been talking about since i started streaming um a year and a half ago um, this is in hometown daily photos show boat disappear as Lake Mead water, uh, levels rise. So I had been talking a year and a half ago about how Lake Mead, uh, and other lakes in the United States and around the world, really the water levels were going down. Suddenly there's, you know, a couple of weeks worth of rain flooding and everybody says, okay, the problem's over, but it took 10 years to get to that point. A couple of days is not going to recover this process um so but people are hyping up that water is returning to uh, the lakes and rivers but 
Um, I'm not sure if this video will actually show it, but um, at least we can kind of let it flow here. Um, after years of drought, Lake Mead, which is located in Nevada and Arizona, reached drastically low levels last summer. Um, I can't remember what it's called. Dead, Dead Lake or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. When it drops below too low uh, for it to generate power. Um, there were uh, several lakes, man-made lakes that were power generation plants as well. And they were getting dangerously, precariously close um, to the, those levels where they can't generate power anymore. Um, it's called Deadpool, by the way. Deadpool. There you go. Um, but the water levels have started to rise after the West Coast wet winter. And these atmospheric rivers, as it was called, um, basically flooding. But it's very brief. And so all it takes is it to go back to the status quo before. Um, and yeah, Toll, I agree. Deadpool is a great character. Now I need to look to see what the history of that name is for Deadpool, because I don't recall why he's called Deadpool. Um, that's actually why I paused. When you said Deadpool, I was like, uh. I, I thought about that too, but I didn't say anything about it. So uh, one of the people that I used to watch on YouTube um, until it just became too focused on other things um, was this. Uh, there was a, a YouTuber that actually gives tours and fishing um, expeditions and stuff like that on Lake Mead and other lakes in the area. And they would go over and camp out around this, not camp out, but hang out and take pictures and show people how low the water got. So this thing, um, this was from September 18th, 2022, reemerged when the drought reduced the Colorado River and the lake to critically low levels. Um, and over time it has returned. I don't know if they're actually going to show it on my screen, but you'll probably be able to see it if you follow the link. Um, it's because um, the, the character's name was based on a fighting tournament um, in a bar. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's because the mercenary group has a pool for their, who will die next. The dead pool. That's right. That was, that was a better description. The, Thank you. Yeah, that's toll. Um, the font of knowledge in the chat. Thank you. Um, yeah, so now I remember because they actually talk about it. Uh, I've never uh, read the comics but um, or graphic novels. Toll, the other AI. <laughs> well, you've chosen a name. My AI has said, I prefer AI, which is fine. Uh, ongoing droughts and overuse have led to uh, a slash in water usage for three Colorado basin states despite a winter of heavy precipitation experts have told newsweek that the only way for lake mead and lake powell to truly recover is if the colorado river basin uh, states reduce their usage yeah i'm sure that all of the corporations are totally on board with it and that people sorry the ai just and the almond in. farms All, yes almond farms almonds are known to use a lot of water hey there's a whole show about it <laughs> Okay, let's keep on hustling through the news. Um, this next article is where I'll be using uh, my context um, from the previous recycling thing. So the, the reason why I would be reluctant to use uh, an engineered plastic board using that particular process is because it was nothing more than particulates fused together. Um, and there was no discernible um, structure, right? So there was some harder stuff, some softer stuff. You wouldn't know if you drilled a hole through it, where it was going to fracture. Um, so I wouldn't use it to build something like this roller coaster. Although this roller coaster seems to have developed something that would be similar, uh, to a fracture in a plastic board, a man plastic manufactured board. So invis investigators visit North Carolina amusement park after closing ride because of crack. We talked about this, I think it was yesterday, 
last night. Um, and so they moved pretty quick. Um, state investigators were on site at North Carolina amusement park after a crack was discovered on a support beam on one of their popular roller coasters. Uh, um, I, I think the state investigators were there faster than the in-house engineer was looking at that, uh, support beam because that video went viral and, um, drew a ton of attention and not in a good way. Um, although it did trigger me into motion to investigate a, a possible, um, not solution, but, um, a possible, uh, function. I don't know how to describe that. Um, anyway, a way to, uh, detect those, uh, issues. Solution. Yeah. A, well, not really. A solu- it wouldn't stop it, but it, you'd know when it happens. Um, so let's go over to the source. And thanks again, Toll, for telling me to post the link. Um, The article title is Investigators Visit North Carolina Amusement Park After Closing Ride Because of Crack, but they've augmented that title to say Fright Over Crack on North Carolina Ride Serves as Reminder of Risks at Amusement Parks. Uh, Hannah Schoenbaum, Kimberly Crucey, and Eric Verduzco from the Associated Press put this article together. Um, A visible crack in the support beam of a North Carolina roller coaster served as a reminder of the risks that sometimes arise with amusement park rides, particularly as families and adrenaline junkies flock to the attractions in summer. Video footage of the Charlotte-based Cora Winds popular Fury 325, known as a Giga Coaster due to its dramatic height of 325 feet, showed a key support beam bending with the top visibly detached as cars packed with unsuspecting passengers whirled by at speeds of up to 95 miles per hour. Can you imagine if you got off the ride and somebody showed you the video? (laughs) Well, I was actually on a on a ride once where you sit on a seat kind of like a a bicycle seat right not like a big beam flat seat or a bench seat but like a bicycle seat and then a armrest comes down to protect you and you put your arms around it um but when i let go it shot up after it was supposed to have been locked down um and that's akin to me just i didn't scream or anything but the ride operator actually stopped the ride before it fully got engaged um and walked over and said hey can you go to the other seat yeah okay i'll do that (laughs) um so yeah i did that and um let me tell you that joke about the pirate asking for his brown pants i'm all over that um So apparently, uh, no longer the musician, Tom Petty has decided to be the chief of uh, State Department of Labor Amusements Device Bureau. Probably a different Tom Petty. It's Tommy Petty. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) Maybe Maybe that's his alter ego. He's a little bit more friendly, a little more approachable. Hey, I'm Tommy Petty. You look just like Tom Petty. Nope, I don't even know who that is. Can you sing Free Fallen for us? Toll says, well, seeing as Tom Petty died last year, that's what they want you to know. How do you think (laughs) Tom Petty becomes Tommy Petty, chief of the State Department of Labor's Amusement Device Bureau? Come on. Device Bureau. Which is just a great name. (laughs) Do you know what else is a device, Toll? A guitar. That's a device. He already has experience in that field. Amusement device, even. Come on. Anyway, confirmed investigators already came and went from Cora Winds on Monday, but declined to share details about their findings. Meanwhile, Cora Winds said in a statement that all of the rides, including Fury 325, are inspected daily. Apparently, it broke after the inspection. Uh, to ensure their proper functioning and structural integrity. What did they do? 
look at just the base and go, yep, it's still there. Well, that's what I was saying yesterday. I mean, I'd like to know if anybody filmed it well before that and how long that crack was there. Uh, Toll says, uh, so you're saying John Len Lennon didn't die and that he's just a body double that got assassinated. Well, John Lennon could be working somewhere entirely else. I mean, they're all uh, massive stars. They have to just, it's like Sia uh, putting her hair down so that you can't really see her face so that she can blend in with society when she uncovers and nobody knows. That's what's going on with uh, Tom Petty and John Lennon. Sure. So Greg Bledsoe, a 22 year old season pass holder visited the park Monday, despite having watched the viral video of Fury 325 track separating from its support being mid ride quote. I'm just glad I wasn't on it because I don't want to fall off. I'm glad nobody fell off. So, um, it is 10 15. So that's our no shit news for 10 15. I mean, is that really your reaction? <laughs> you think it might be a little stronger. Yeah, you know, I'd probably have a little bit more to say. Like, as Johnny Lemon living as a device manager at an amusement park in Boca. Yes. I that is completely doable. <laughs> <laughs> and have you ever seen Johnny Lemon and John Lennon in the same room together? No. And now oh, you know why. Might be onto something. Dun dun dun. Um, for Stephen Powers, a resident of Columbia, South Carolina, who visited Corwin's Monday with friends, the positive atmosphere of the park outweighs any worries. <laughs> sure. Crazy Cat Lady says that there's <laughs> somewhere a roller coaster was stuck upside down for three hours today. Oh, that's interesting. In Wisconsin at a festival ride. So it, I guess. Uh, uh, park rides are the new trains they're all it's all becoming allergic to physics and either stopping or braking we hope um, so yeah okay let's keep on going oh did you have video for that really you're gonna make me back up yeah yeah I'll, here's the video oh my god that is just here I'm gonna blow it up and play it again We bet what? Look at that. <laughs> oh God. I, I'm not cr quite sure what that's all about. I think they're trying to hide <laughs> the person's face or identity, but oh, that's a I'm zip. not sure what they're trying whoa! to hide. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. I'm going to get out of there. I just um, meant for the roller coaster part. Yeah, I don't know the what roller, that was. That roller coaster ride thing. I don't know. Yeah, a child getting knocked off of a zip line. Hopefully they're okay. I don't know. Um, so don't like that. Okay, so uh, now that um, uh, we showed that, we could probably get our channel kicked off, but we'll see. Um, okay, let's go on to the next article. Uh, Scotland's iconic Orkney Islands, considering quitting Britain to become part of Norway. So there you go. You don't necessarily, well, you can just change it. I'm just going to align myself with a completely different country. Scotland's iconic Orkney Islands archipelago is looking at ways it might split off from the UK and potentially become a self-governing territory of Norway. You know what ride <laughs> toll says um you know what rides are pretty safe water rides yep safe in the water yeah, until a shark comes up to bite you i just spent much of the day playing dave the diver and i can tell you the water isn't safe either and i'm a former scuba diver so i've had uh, i've interfaced with nature that would be an exciting water slide. Avoid the shark at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Better hope it has like an uplift at the end. So you go flying over the shark. Yeah, really jump the shark. 
Um, so this is over at CNBC. Karen Gilcrest is the author of this. Um, under new proposals brought forward by the local council, the Orkney Islands will explore alternative forms of governance, including changing its legal status within Britain. The goal is to uh, secure greater economic independence, according to council leader James Stockin, who brought the motion. I guess everybody is doing their own independence. It's interesting. Um, let's see here. One proposed, uh, one potential route being considered could see the archipelago leverage its energy production capabilities, including an oil terminal on Flota Island and other renewable resources to gather or to gain greater economic independence. According to council leader, James Stockin, who brought the motion Stockin said that no thorough analysis of Orkney's contributions to the UK um, economy had been carried out. And as such, the islands had been failed dreadfully by both the UK and Scottish governments and neglected of fair funding. I guess they've just uh, always been there. So it's, they were summarily ignored, you know? Okay. I have to wonder what was the reaction when this was brought up in the local council meeting? Yeah. Somebody just woke up one morning and said, Hey, you want to go independent? I mean, the U S did it. I imagine somebody laughed out loud when this proposal was brought forward. So do you think it's going to work? Well, I think um, Norway might like it, especially if they have resources like oil. Would they? Think? I don't know what would have to transpire for this to happen, though. I guess if they, yeah, if they are oil if they are energy producing, so net positive in value, then they wouldn't be a burden in any way on Norway. And thus, as long as they're autonomous, but under the control, I guess, in partnership with Norway, because I think Norway is, um, what do they call it? Um, like the culture is, um, what do they call it? I don't know how to say it. Are you thinking of like Huga? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure. Um, let me let me look into it. Um, so, uh, Tola saying they got the idea from Scotland trying to seed from the UK and Brexit. They, uh, I guess, they thought let's do this. Um, n no, the um, it's um, what do you call it? It's contiguous it's it's like the same population it isn't um balkanized like the united states like it isn't a massive melting pot of uh different people historically right it's been the same i can't remember homogenous there you go that's the word that i'm looking for it's more homogenous um and so it's harder to become a citizen, I think, in Norway. And so if you come on board, then you, it's kind of like Sweden. You have to work a little bit harder and, and be a positive influence. Um, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of countries that say, well, you can. And, and that's how it's done in spirit. But with a lot of countries, all you have to do is come with enough money. And they're like, yep, come on in. Um, we even talked about that. We had a whole show that had, um, a discussion about that. So you walk in with $15,000 and you become a citizen of that country. So pretty, I had come up with uh, homogenous right when toll, uh, said it in chat. So I swear toll is like one you know, third I'm of my brain tolls come in for my job. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Humans coming for an AI job. <laughs> you better sleep with one eye open ai <laughs> capitalize the i in ai so the islands are home to some of the oldest and best preserved neolithic sites in europe as well as a stunning landscapes and a wealth of marine and avian wildlife um we were part of the norse kingdom uh, for much longer than we were part of the united kingdom stock and said 
on the street in Orkney, people come up and say to me when we are uh, going to pay back the dowry, when are we going to pay, uh, going back to Norway. So if they were part of Norway and it was just kind of taken over by the UK, then, hey, you know, everything old is new again. So go home. Yeah. Join up with Norway. UK I have absolutely like no it. problem. I'm sorry. I said UK might not like it. Yeah. Well, nobody likes change, but here you have it. Toll says, well, if you live in a town of Scotland, Connecticut, you can pay a small tithe to the country of Scotland and be Lord or lady of a one square foot plot of Scottish forest. Okay. That's interesting. Cause there was a thing about that. Um, recently Toll says that they love change makes things nice to fidget with in their pocket. Different kind of change, Toll. Slightly different. <laughs> bank of change. Bank of change. You know, if you go to the bank of change with a quarter, we're going to give you five nickels. We're not going to give you any more than what you give us. At the bank of change. So uh, the next article is over on Hometown Daily. Stop shooting your guns at the sky. Philadelphia officials plead ahead of July 4th. Don't do stupid. Well, hate to break it to you, but people are going to do stupid, particularly between now and July 4th. Uh, this won't even go out to anybody until probably tomorrow morning. So hopefully somebody, some more people see it over in the podcast and over in uh, YouTube. Um, but I don't think that it's going to... The people that need to see this message just don't see this message. And they, it's kind of like Title IX training or the hacking training. Everybody takes it, but the people that need to learn the lessons from it don't. They, they or come to the, during the class or whatever. They, <laughs> they come walking into the office and go, you know, I took that sexual harassment class and I totally knew everything already. I didn't get any new tips. And yet I still smack somebody on the ass and I end up in HR. Anyway, Philadelphia officials are urging residents to refrain from celebratory gunfire on July 4th. District Attorney Larry Krasner said firing a gun in the air is both dangerous and a crime. Don't do stupid. Krasner urged Philadelphians. Yeah, I don't think that this is really going to hit the... Oh, I was going to say hit the target in their marketing, but that is too soon. Uh, Charles R. Davis over at businessinsider.com put this article together. Um, and really, this is just the nuts and bolts. What I just said is pretty much this article. Uh, they'll go into greater detail about how you know people are firing into the air and how people, I'm sure, are getting hurt by it periodically from those bullets coming down. But guess what, folks? What goes up? must come down so this is reminiscent of uh when they were uh warning in south carolina don't shoot up at the weather balloon yeah that's right don't fire your gun at the chinese surveillance balloon i mean weather balloon i mean whatever it was because they didn't they still haven't really definitively described what this thing is have they was it actually no. a surveillance balloon we don't know we what was know. the other stuff that was shot down? We don't know. Yeah, wait. I feel like everything is so transparent that I just I see everything. You know, I've I've seen it all. I I know all about this stuff now. Okay, two more articles and then we're done. Let's go on to the next one. Hawaii observatories add color depth to a European Euclid mission. Um, launched on July 1st, 2023, the European Euclid mission will observe billions of galaxies over one third of the sky to create a map of the universe. But Euclid's map will be in black and white. Telescopes in Hawaii, including the Subaru uh, telescope, are needed to determine the colors of the galaxies. The color data will be used to deduce the uh, distance, thus creating a 3D map uncovering the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. So this is going to be freaking awesome uh, when it is all compiled and uh, displayed. And I hope, I hope, I hope that they put this into VR and you can just go zooming around the observable universe um, 
in a uh, VR world or universe. Yeah, that's probably a better turn of phrase. The European Space Agency uh, Euclid Space Telescope mission will explore the mysteries of dark matter, dark energy, and cosmic evolution. Oh. Toll, I'm so sorry. Hold on one second. Let me... I... Keep... Did you forget to post Man. the link again? You know, I can't wait until we get the uh, auction... Or not the auction, the... Uh, um election site updated so we're gonna make it so that all you have to do is go to one site and you can click on all of the links to get it um i'll i will still try and put them into the chat um but it'll be a simple command away so that all you have to do is um type in exclamation point election and it'll take you over there or some other thing i might say articles or something Anyway, apologies. Sorry about that. I know it slows you all down from engaging in conversation. So um, there's the links and feel free to go here. I'm going to give you the next one just so that you have it now. And if you are all are motivated, you can go over and check it out. Okay. So um, yeah, this, uh, this new um, process is going to give depth and color to the universe, the observable uh, sky. So this is going to be awesome. It says without atmospheric interference, Euclid can clearly capture the shape of galaxies and detect the gravitational lensing effect in which the gravitational field uh, of a foreground object distorts the image of a distant galaxy. But Euclid is equipped with only one filter at or in optical wavelengths, meaning that Euclid takes black and white images to precisely determine the distances to galaxies, images taken with multiple filters are necessary. That is why collaboration with ground-based telescopes is essential. So it's basically going to be able to look into the deeper, darker sky without any light noise from uh, any technology on Earth um, or the atmosphere. Um, but the ground-based telescopes will be able to insert that color data um, and from a slightly different angle, so you'll get a greater dimensionality there. Um, the three observatories uh, started the Union's project prior to launch to survey the northern sky in optical and near-infrared wavelengths, and the project will cover almost one-third of Euclid's observation area. Union's is a consortium of telescopes in Hawaii, CF. HT equipped with Megacam observes in shorter wavelength bands. The Subaru telescope equipped with hyper subprime uh, cam observes mainly in longer wavelength bands and two pan stars telescopes equipped with a gigapixel camera observe in an intermediate wavelength band. Um, so this is pretty neat. They're actually going to get some serious distance in there instead of kind of extrapolating from radio astronomy data where something might be this looks like it's going to be optical and um, from a different perspective it'll be like binocular vision pretty cool uh, they say i'm a, the quote here is i'm excited about the launch because the time has come for many scientists dreams to come true says miyazaki probably not the uh, developer the, the game developer miyazaki um who has been aware of the uh, mission from since the 2000s. He believes that collaboration with cutting edge international missions will be increasingly important for the Subaru telescope. Quote, our collaboration with uh, Euclid will be a role model. Yeah, I should hope so. Yeah, science shouldn't be political and all it needs is good money. <clears throat> so there you go, folks. Um, so let's move on to the next one. And this is actually going to kind of close the book on um, this new VTOL car plane something. Let's get into it. So yesterday we talked about the ALF flying car video. Actually, the ALF flying car. And... I said, I'm going to have to look into this. And luckily this was submitted. I think the AI found this 
Uh, Toll says, sounds good. They're using the European Euclid scope as a lens for the infrared scope to measure distant galaxies. Yep. It's going to be pretty cool to see. Man, I really want to see this stuff too. Um, so the aeronautical startups Model A was the first to receive FAA approval, but doesn't have any wings. So how will it fly? And that was one of the things that when I was observing it, I was like, well, it must have uh, something underneath it. You can still drive it around, but it's basically just uh, a, a, an electric car and then blowers or something underneath the car because it doesn't have any wings. Well, um, when I saw this article, I ended up watching this and reading a little bit more about it and something that we noticed but didn't understand became very apparent. So let's go over to the source of this. Oh, I scrolled down a little bit further. So over in Newsweek, um, Alex Phillips is the author of this article. And uh, this video does not demonstrate what that car does. Okay, so if you go over there, it, this isn't going to help you because it's a $300,000 uh, flying car. It says they're a staple of futuristic science fiction films such as Blade Runner and Total Recall, but the possibility of owning a flying car may quickly become a present reality, um, provided you can afford the $300,000 price tag. I do not see that happening. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. I think that they're getting, they're going to be able to do this demonstrator kind of thing, but I don't think that this is going to come to fruition in any real way. Maybe they're going to make two or three of these things. I may be poo-pooing this, but um, I, I just I just don't see it. Other than it won't be in populated areas. I'll put it to you that way. This thing will not fly into town and 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 pick up a pizza and fly the hell back out. Uh, Toll says this is a unique take on previous designs on flying cars. Not very practical, but unique. Yes. Um, but so what we thought was a contiguous body is actually holes. This is a big grid. It's like a, a, a waffle iron, except that it goes all the way through. So it, it's like a, 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 what do you want to call it? it? It's like a barbecue grill. <laughs> um, it It's, this does not do it justice, but they show it flying. And I thought that this was just a render and was showing kind of like an x-ray view in that the air would be flowing down around this bubble um but it wasn't banking or anything this thing actually leans up on its side and this pivots so that you can fly it's basically flying towards us and there's a propeller there 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 actually there's eight of them so there's one there one there one there one there one there, one there, one there, one there. These are wheels, electric motor powered wheels. Um, and this is this little bubble that you sit in. And it actually flies up and tilts over and then flies forward. Um, and it's basically a drone, but very, very heavy. Um, and I just don't see this thing being well controllable, at least in this iteration. It's kind of like a car that has a really narrow and close wheelbase it, um, or only three wheels and the wheels are in the wrong location. You know, um, it's going to be tippy canoe and, and difficult to control. But again, maybe it's just me and at first blush, um, but you're going to have to be a highly skilled pilot to fly this thing. Um, I just don't see a regular, you know, Joe Smith hopping in this thing. <clears throat> um, so Toll says the cockpit is basically on a gyro so at auto levels like a weird combination of helicopter and fixed wing aircraft yeah so it's this weird VTOL vehicle so it'll lift off and then it will pivot like an off uh, Osprey and then fly and we know what the problems with an Osprey are it gets a low pressure on one side and just flips its ass over you know tip over tail it just doesn't well, maybe they've increased its reliability over the years, but I know that it's over budget and underdone. 
Um, so the whole car becomes a wing, a biplane, a circular wing. The founder of the Stanford Science Fiction Society said, adding that the car has a very specific body geometry to allow it to fly with limited resistance. Um, it basically looks, this little grid looks like the grid pattern from the SpaceX um, uh, body landing. So when it starts to land, it has these little grids, um, things that wings essentially that guide the, the top of the lander. Um, and that's basically what it looks like, except solid. They're not pivoting anything. Um, only these little uh, rotors are actually inside the car. So that's why we were like, where the hell are the wings? It can't be a flying car, really. But this thing is, really amounts to a drone and it's just going to like fling itself over a hill somewhere. And hopefully the AI, there we go again, right? The AI is going to balance this vehicle out and you're going to land. Never had anything to do with the Osprey, but from what I hear, they are extremely reliable now and the Marines love them for troop transportation. Yeah, I do know that um, the Marines love them for troop transports and the Osprey program has been um, kind of hit or miss for a long time. So maybe they got it all right and they fixed the aeronautics in it. So um, it says, uh, while many new cars are designed to have aerodynamic bodywork, research suggests that the average wed wedge shaped car has a drag coefficient, the amount of friction resistance relative to its velocity of between 0.3 and 0.4. By comparison, a Boeing 747 has a drag coefficient of 0 0.024. So if they're trying to hint that this thing is going to have a lower or equal drag coefficient of the Boeing 747, they're out of their mind <laughs> because all of this is creating resistance, but whatever, I'm not going to belabor that. Um, also, I'm kind of weirded it's at out. It's at least the... 0.10 away from those. So I think it's significantly different from the 747. Oh yeah. Yeah, I can imagine uh, the whole thing. Uh, I don't know how anybody can compare it to an actual jet, but um, whatever. Um, plus, I don't like to judge a book by its cover, but the, the CEO of this company kind of weirds me out. <laughs> um, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, Tull says, man, if only we weren't phasing out lighter internal combustion engine vehicles, maybe we could create propellers that could extend out from a car and generate enough power to wait um, to create lift. Well, there actually have been, um, not pivoting out though, um, there have been other, I've, I had been really into this uh, when I was a lot younger and interested in this stuff. I designed one, um, a, basically a VTOL vehicle that acted like this except that it had air intakes and wasn't a big grid and ran, resembled a lamborghini countach but whatever um that's the little kid in me designing a vehicle um and so i guess in a way i predicted this um except for this little grid pattern thing this little i don't know what you want to call it um if anybody's going to get upset about this, the first time a bird gets ingested, people are going to get really miffed about this. <laughs> uh, but this car, this this vehicle here, Flying Car Company uh, Boss completes commute in $83,000 space age vehicle. This one actually looks like fun. Um, and I'll let that one play. Uh, there we go. And let me zoom in. Boop. So I dig this one. Uh, I would love to see races with this um, only because it's a single seater, a single person seater drone. It's like a speeder bike. And uh, I would love to see this in, in racing. Tulsa says, heard a great podcast from Dan Crenshaw interviewing Roger Pelk Jr. 
where they talk about the differences in EVs and ICE from a raw material and carbon coefficient standpoint. Oh, got it. What's the name of the podcast? So, uh, for those in the pod that are listening to this via the podcast, sorry for the dead air. Basically, this looks like um, a, a dune buggy with a drone propeller system instead of wheels. So, I, on, at the four points, it's a drone propeller. And um, you're basically flying through the countryside <laughs> in this thing. It looks like a blast. Uh, obviously, as time moves forward, the engineering gets better, but this thing um, is kind of slow going. It's It doesn't have a long range because I looked into it previously. I can't remember what it was. It was like a 15 minute uh, flight time, I think. Um, and um, if they land hard, this is like a spine breaker because um, it doesn't have any landing gear in the conventional sense of landing gear, like no rubber wheels or anything like that. It just lands on the frame from what I could tell. Um, but it's pretty neat. And uh, if I was given one, I wouldn't turn it away. It's pretty cool. So he's coming to land on a landing pad in somebody's backyard. That thing has to be so damn loud. Like you're in a helicopter, but worse because there's nothing shielding you from any of the noise. Not even, you know, the a, a pretend um, body or something, you know, just outer covering. So Tull said, uh, look up, we hold these truths. Episode from July 1st. Oh, I'll check it out. It says he completes his commute. So I think that is the heli helipad in his office. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, well, that is it for today's show. I really appreciate uh, Toll helping out with so much. I mean, reminding me to not derp on those links and um, letting us have a conversation um about the uh, the news that we're talking about and extending it because um i think i've heard of we hold these truths um as a podcast but i've never pulled it up but i'll go and take a look at it right after the show um pretty cool i love this stuff so thank you very much everybody for coming in and hanging out by the way um what we normally do at the end of the show is we drag you kicking and screaming to the front page of or the main street of hometown and mash that welcome sign. And um, we'd look for some new articles. Oh, my God. Teens warning after contracting brain eating amoeba at Florida Beach as if it wasn't bad enough. Um, let's see anything else i want to see something happy go lucky nope that's not it uh not the westport impasse nope that's not it yeah that's that's coming on fast rivian delivers first electric vans to mm -hmm. amazon in europe that's cool i hope they do better than their trucks meta's new twitter moving tweet deck behind paywall <laughs> oh wow like they're just trying to burn it all to the ground it seems it, like yeah jeez I cannot believe that a new message from Jenny Prigozhin who released a new audio message um, Meta's Twitter competitor launches on July 6th according to the App Store uh, great I don't want to be part of Meta's Twitter competitor. <laughs> um, let's see. I don't know. Maybe I should just start talking about the daily horoscope. 2024 Rolls Royce Spectre proves EVs make the best luxury vehicles. Yeah, probably. 
uh regarding it's hard not to be when you're already such an expensive car yeah well the rolls royce specter is an expensive car it's going to be even more expensive isn't it as an ev um toll says uh, that they like um we hold these truths. Crenshaw is a representative from Houston, and he interviews people on topics relevant to his committees and current topics, like he did a tell-all about why he voted against the budget ceiling increase. And um, also says, someone told Elon Musk that Twitter was too big to fail. He said, hold my organic beer. <laughs> hold, <laughs> hold my kombucha. Yeah, exactly. Um, but he's not going to get impacted. I mean, even if he loses $40 million, he's got another 200 just laying there, uh, creating more wealth than most people see in their entire lives. And he does it in a month um, because money begets money so much easier than hard work begets money. Um, and when you have it in spades because you're not spending your family money, um, yeah, when you can get government grants and then call everybody else funded by the government. <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. Anyway, um, yeah, this is. <sighs> but there are there are gems in here. There's information. Uh, honestly, uh, um, it's there's a, such a broad gamut of news that uh, don't let one page slow you down. Um, so it all gets filtered into about 50 different channels under six main groups. And then we have um, our daily election and the podcast is listed here. So you can listen to the podcast hometown, which is this show just in audio format um, right here on the site. You don't have to download a, a pod catcher, but keep this in mind. If you are here, follow us. Uh, the AI and I do this show every day at 9 p.m. Eastern, and we're usually on nowadays until about 11. Um, then it goes over to YouTube for long-term storage and additional community, and then it gets turned into a podcast as well. And in all of these spaces, there is a place for you to um, either vote it up or make a review, uh, like the, the Apple side of things. If you leave a podcast review there and, and uh, give me five stars, I'll read your review, whatever it might be, good or bad, here on uh, on stream. Um, as long as it isn't, you know, offensive in nature. Um, and if it's a negative review and you give me five stars and uh, and it isn't like hostile or, or, or uh, vitriolic or anything like that. I'll read it. It might hurt me uh, spiritually, <laughs> but I'll still read it. Um, that said, go over to YouTube too and follow us over there and uh, uh, like, subscribe, ring the bell, leave a comment. All of these things help us succeed in bringing more shows and uh, I stopped doing this at the beginning of the show and rarely talk about it at the end of the show, but each one of these under these categories are actual channels that I want to bring to Twitch with a host or co-host. But to do that, I need to keep moving forward and growing the community. Now I don't advertise. I, I want it to be organic. I don't want to just throw money on the table and suddenly people just start clicking a link. Um, I, I, I don't want it to be, um fake I, I i don't want to fake it to make it i want uh those who find value in hanging out telling people that they respect and trust and might be interested and then they come as well and we have a, a great conversation uh, i hope uh toll enjoys the conversation um crazy cat lady is probably knitting um, there are others Z might be in here um, lurking. I don't know um, the, the stats in real time data coming out of Twitch uh, for streamers is spotty at best because it's basically a web browser based interface and web browsers time out after a short amount of time. If there's no interaction, basically not knit. I'm sorry, Toll, uh, don't unsubscribe. Um, uh, crochet crochet sorry about that um sorry about that man i i felt that tisk i i heard a tisk and a <laughs> hand coming at me like smack 
get it right. It's crochet, not knit. I felt a poke of a crochet needle like poke. Get it right. I'm probably using the wrong term for what the instrument is. Um, man. Now I'm in trouble. See what happens when you just, when you start monologuing? A crochet hook. There you go. See, and when that hook goes in, it just stays, it catches. It's like a fish hook, except that it's supposed to be doing something creative. Anyway, please don't wound the mare. That's what you get for going off script. <laughs> You're right, Tol. Oh, there is no script here. <laughs> there is no script. We're doing it live. Um, so, okay. Well, anyway, um, sorry about the sidetrack. I am, uh, easily distracted by little motes of dust in the light. Um, so yeah, all of these are actual shows. And if you are interested in being a host or a co-host, because there's a whole bunch of different topics, um, I, um, I'm willing to entertain launch a squirrel. I saw that toll. <laughs> um, Okay, we're done. <laughs> I'm Mirwat. That's hometown.com. Up there is the AI that's probably going to say, have a good night, citizens. Pick up that can. They never say that. I'm not going to say pick up that can. <laughs> have a good night, hometown citizens. We'll see you tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern. Dunkstar, you made it. Yay. Toll, thanks so much for hanging out. Really appreciate it. Uh, Tull says, good night, Madam AI. Well, thank and, you. Good night. And that's it. I'm going to miss y'all. See you tomorrow, 9 p.m., at least 9 p.m. I hope I see you 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be streaming probably Dave the Diver. Um, and then, because I fixed my problem, Forever Skies, I'll have to reacquire that. Oh, man, now something's in my eye. Okay, I'm going to get out of here because I'm really going off script. See you tomorrow. Good night. See you soon, Dunk. Bye. Do, do, do. And Z's here too. Oh my God. Everybody's showing up at 11. Take care, everybody. Bye. Oh, wait. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send you all over to uh, Miranda. Dun, 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 raid. Raid now. This is all going to stay in the recording. Take care, everybody. Bye.